BestBookBits.com presents Maximize Your Potential, Grow Your Expertise, Take Bold Risks, Build an Incredible Career by Jocelyn Glee, published in 2013 and weighing in at 272 pages. Success isn't about being the best, it's about always getting better. Can you step outside your comfort zone, bounce back from failure, build new skills? Tapping into your true potential is no ideal endeavor. It demands creativity, dedication, and a whole lot of hustle. With wisdom from 21 leading creative minds, 99 U's Maximize Your Potential will show you how to generate new opportunities, cultivate your creative expertise, build valuable relationships, and take bold new risks so that you can utilize your talents to the fullest. The written summary can be found on our website, bestbookbits.com. So without further ado, I bring you the book summary of Maximize Your Potential. Comedian Milton Beryl used to say, if opportunity doesn't knock, build a door. If we want to realize our full potential as creatives and individuals, being proactive isn't just an option, it's a requirement. Having the ability to chart your own course shifts the onus of leadership back onto you. This means that we cannot expect our managers to take charge of our career developments and groom us for greatness. We cannot wait quietly for the perfect mentor to arrive and guide us in the development of our craft, and we cannot count on a future fulfilled with signpost and opportunity. Your ability to realize your potential will depend upon your willingness to hone your skills, to take bold risks, and to put your ego on the line in the pursuit of something greater. Traditional career advice suggests a passive approach to finding your calling. Pick a job listing, apply, wait for a response, get the job, perform your duties, wait for a promotion, rinse, repeat, stagnate. But a wait-and-see attitude is hardly the path to greatness. With the access and resources to over 21st century at our fingertips, we can and should be active participants in shaping our future. We must seek out opportunities by strategizing with the resourcefulness and adaptability of a startup entrepreneur, and we must draw opportunity to us by relentlessly developing our raw skills, excelling at our craft in a way that cannot go unnoticed. We must look at the market and align our interests and abilities with something that people actually want, and we must keep an our ear to the ground for the next unexpected, never holding so tightly to our plans that we let luck pass us by. Greatness doesn't come from taking a lean back approach to career planning. Get out in the front of opportunity and it will come to you. Follow your passion is bad advice. Very few people have pre-existing passions that they can match to a job. Telling them to follow their passion therefore is a recipe for anxiety and failure. To build a career, the right question is not what job am I passionate about doing, but instead what way of working and living will nurture my passion. Following your passion Choosing a career path solely because you are already passionate about the nature of the work is a poor strategy for accomplishing this goal. It assumes that you have a pre-existing passion to follow that matches to a viable career and that matching your work to a strong interest is sufficient to build long-term career satisfaction. Both of those assumptions are flawed. It teaches us that we should begin by systematically developing rare and valuable skills. Once you've caught the attention of the marketplace, we can then use these skills as leverage to direct our career toward the general lifestyle traits, autonomy, flexibility, impact, growth, etc. that resonate with us. Put another way, don't follow your passion, cultivate it. Muhammad Yunus, Nobel Peace Prize winner and microfinance pioneer says, all human beings are entrepreneurs. When we were in the caves, we were all self-employed finding our food, feeding ourselves. That's where human history began. As civilization came, we suppressed it. We became labor because they stamped us. You are labor. We forgot that we are entrepreneurs. All humans are entrepreneurs, not because of the people should start companies, but because they will to create and forage and adapt is part of our DNA. As Eunice says, these qualities are the essence of entrepreneurship. To adapt to the challenges of the world today, you need to rediscover these entrepreneurial instincts. Keeping yourself in a permanent beta makes you acknowledge that you have bugs, that there's more testing to do on yourself 
and that you will continue to adapt and evolve. It means a lifelong commitment to continuous personal growth. It is a mindset of brimming with optimism because it celebrates the fact that you have the power to improve yourself and more important, improve the world around you. You need to have very little tolerance for stagnation. And if something you're working on doesn't go the way you want it, you need to have a high capacity for discarding it and moving on to something else. The guiding principle is your own passion and your own search for meaning. What mission are you on? What is the mission that you are trying to fulfill in your life that gives your business meaning, that gives your work meaning? And the answer to that may change over time. You may have various missions during the course of your life, but that's what you dedicate, how you should be spending your energy. It's easy to get sucked into chasing after a specific job title, whether it's becoming a creative director, a chief marketing officer, or a product manager. But titles are a trap. Titles are a trap. The job you want today may not exist tomorrow. Thus, by tailoring your goals and your skill development to attaining a specific position, you limit your options. Rather than setting your sights on a specific role, focus instead on what you want to accomplish. Lucky people take advantage of chance occurrences that come their way. Instead of going through life on cruise control, they pay attention to what's happening around them and therefore are able to extract a greater value from each situation. Lucky people are also open to novel opportunities and willing to try things outside of their usual experiences. They're more inclined to pick up a book on unfamiliar subject, to travel to less familiar destinations, and to interact with people who are different than themselves. Aside from lots of hard work, great creative careers are powered by an intersection of three factors, interest, skill, and opportunity. It's easy to sleepwalk through life, to operate at the level of good enough, and to define a destination, and then go on autopilot. But if we want to truly exceed in our careers, we must awaken to our own profound capacity for growth. Our intelligence, our talents, and even our habits are all remarkably malleable. Focusing on getting better rather than being good. Focusing on getting better rather than being good. When we have a be good mindset, we are constantly comparing our performance with that of other people's to see how we size up and to receive validation for our talents. This is the mindset we end up with when we are given too much ability praise and come to believe that our talents are innate and unchanging. It's also the mindset we often unconsciously adapt when our environment is highly evaluative, when our work is constantly exposed to the judgment of others. A get better mindset, on the other hand, leads instead to self-comparison and a concern with making progress. How well am I doing today compared with how I did yesterday, last month or last year? Are my talents and abilities developing over time? Am I moving closer to becoming the creative professional I want to be? Compare your performance today with your performance last week or last year rather than comparing yourself with other people. Embedded in these findings are powerful and highly specific lessons for anyone seeking mastery. The first one has to do with the power of ritual. A ritual is a highly precise behavior you do at a specific time so that it becomes automatic over time and no longer requires much conscious intention or energy. The best way to practice is in time limited sprints rather than for an unabound number of hours. It's far less burdensome to mobilize attention on a task if you've got clear starting and stopping points. The ability to focus single-mindedly lies at the heart of mastering any challenge. Time-limited sessions also make it easier to tolerate abstaining from distractions such as email and social media. The third key to mastery is perhaps the most counterintuitive. It's the importance of restoration. Many of us fear that taking time for rest and renewal will brand us as slackers. More, bigger, faster, for longer remains a prevailing ethic in most corporate cultures. In fact, rest is a critical component of achieving sustainable excellence over time. Researchers have found that our conscious mind is better understood as an explainer of our actions, not the cause of them. Instead of triggering the action itself, our consciousness tries to explain why we took the action after the fact 
with varying degrees of success. This means that even the choices we do appear to make intentionally are at least somewhat influenced by our unconscious patterns. Opportunities flow through people. If you want a job, what you need is someone to hire you. If you want capital to start a business, what you need is an investor. If you want to sell a product, what you need is a customer. At every stage in our careers, whatever level of opportunity or growth we seek, we depend on relationships to drive us forward. In a world of collaborative creation, whom we surrender ourselves with dictates how much we can achieve. Views contrary to our own are always helpful, as sometimes you will see the truth in them and affect change. And, if not, you will be stress testing and ultimately strengthening your own convictions. At the heart of social contracting is spending time up front talking about the how, the relationship and how we'll work together. Rather than being subdued by the what, the excitement and the urgency of the content, what needs to be sorted out and solved. If you don't ask, you'll never get. If you don't ask, you'll never get. Sure, you may only get a little bit at a time, but if you don't ask 100% of the time, you won't get. You've, we live in a connection economy. If you can't connect with people for them to understand what you have to offer, you're working in a vacuum and you're going to lose out. You'll end up getting bitter in that situation because you see your peers are moving up and doing things and you say, I could be doing those things. Why not me? The underlying spirit of networking is generosity. If you engage with people in the spirit of generosity, as opposed to tit for tat, I gave you three things, now you give me three things. You'll go so much further. Too much familiarity in your creative team can lead to stagnation, while too little can mean you're constantly out of sync and spinning your wheels. The most important takeaway for you as an individual might well lie in understanding the paramount importance of collaboration. If you really want your creative projects to take off, don't go it alone. Realizing your full creative potential and that of others, not just dreaming up visions, but doing the work of execution, not just solo creation, but co-creation with others. Not just issuing commands, but collaborating with expert partners. Keep your hand in, even if you move in a management role. Doing this will have several benefits. Number one, on a personal level, you'll derive satisfaction from doing the work yourself. Number two, it will deepen your understanding of the challenges faced by your team. And three, since most creatives make judgments based on talent and achievement, you'll maintain the respect of your team. When you take charge of a project, start by inspiring people with your vision and make sure all those involved are crystal clear about their responsibilities and non-negotiable deliverables. But don't micromanage or insist they do everything your way. If you really want to get the best out of them, leave plenty of gaps for them to fill with their creative and initiative. Co-creation involves letting go of control, listening, really listening to people around you and delegating responsibility to them. Most of all, it means building trust, earning the trust of others, trusting them in return and trusting that together you can build something bigger and more inspiring than any of you could achieve on your own. Nothing great has ever been achieved by sticking with the status quo. If you want to create something new and different, risk-taking needs to be part of your repertoire. But that's easier said than done, when our brains are hardwired to avoid uncertainty and play it safe. When we think about risks, we think about failure. When we think about failures, we start to get scared. When we start to get scared, our brains send out signals to get the hell out of there. The upside of risk is that no matter what the outcome, we act, we learn, and we grow. And when tomorrow comes, we're better equipped to face it. In the body, we have a psychological immune system to fight threats to our mental health. We identify silver linings, rationalize our actions, and find meaning in our setbacks. We don't realize how effective this immune system is, however, because it operates largely beneath the conscious awareness. When we think about taking a risk, we rarely consider how good we will be at reframing a disappointing outcome. In short, we underestimate our resilience. Failure gives us feedback 
that we use to address our regrettable actions and improve our situation in the future. Of the many regrets people describe, regrets of inaction outnumber those of action by nearly 2 to 1. Regrets of inaction outnumber those of action by nearly 2 to 1. Some of the most common include not pursuing more education, not being more assertive, and failing to seize the moment. When people reflect later in life, it is the things that they did not do that generate the greatest despair. Imagining the realization of the opportunity is much harder, but not making the attempt guarantees you won't realize the ultimate benefits. It is necessary to broaden the mind, see the bigger picture, and know that with determination, obstacles will be overcome. Many of life's failures are people who do not realize how close they were to success when they gave up. Thomas Edison. Failure is inevitable, and that the key to success is not dodging every bullet, but being able to recover quickly. The key is being able to see these experiences as experiments that yield valuable data and to learn what to do differently next time. For most successful people, the bottom is lined with rubber as opposed to concrete. When they face a failure, they hit bottom, sink in, and they bounce back, tapping into the energy of the impact to propel them into another opportunity. There are five primary types of risks, physical, social, emotional, financial, and intellectual. I often ask people to map their own risk profile. With only a little bit of reflection, each person knows which type of risks he or she is willing to take. They realize pretty quickly that the risk taking isn't uniform. Move too slowly and there's no output. The process becomes consumed by inertia and either suffers from paralysis or moves at a pace that's so slow that all but ensures the endeavor is killed before it ever yields meaningful output. Nothing truly innovative, nothing that has advanced art, business, design, or humanity was ever created in the face of genuine certainty or perfect information. But dig a little bit deeper and you find one of the most fundamental truths about success in design, business, in innovation generally. It comes down to this. None of these people or organizations really had much of a clue as to exactly which one of their ideas was going to work. Success, it turns out, has far less to deal with figuring out exactly what the right next move is and far more to do with serendipity and randomness. The more times you try, the more likely that you will create successful designs, startups, or pieces of art. If you should place many bets to increase your chances of success, then it also follows that you cannot afford to do so if those bets are large. If just one of those large bets fails, you may not get a second chance since you will be out of resources. Ultimately, we tend to believe that if we just had more money or increase our chances of success. The facts on the ground don't support such a view. The world is random and unpredictable, which means that it is close to impossible to outline exactly what your next best move is. But you can explore it by doing and trying. Just make sure you don't go in all before you figured out that it works. The better you know, the same things you know. They've had the same successes you've had, and they've made the same mistakes. They strive for the same virtues and falter to the same vices. The better you procrastinates, too. The better you is not perfect. But the difference between you and the better you is that the latter reacts a little faster, with a little more willpower. They practice their virtues a little more often and succumb to their vices a little less often. They reign in the procrastination a little quicker. They start their work a little earlier. They know when to take a break a little sooner. And that's a wrap on Maximize Your Potential by Jocelyn Glee. Subscribe to our channel and take a look at the hundreds of book summaries uploaded previously. To find hundreds of written summaries, check out our website, bestbookbits.com. And for hundreds of audio podcast summaries, find us on mixcloud.com forward slash bestbookbits. Like and share if you got something from this summary and comment on what one thing stood out for you. Thanks for watching and have yourself an amazing day. Take care.